being here as we look at the readings for this coming Sunday. The first reading is from the first book of Kings. In those days, Elijah the prophet went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the entrance of the city, a widow was gathering sticks there. He called out to her, Please bring me a small cup full of water to drink. She left to get it, and he called out after her, Please bring along a bit of bread. She answered, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. There is only a handful of flour in my jar and a little oil in my jug. Now, I was collecting a couple of sticks to go in and prepare something for myself and my son. When we have eaten it, we shall die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you propose. But first make me a little cake and bring it to me. Then you can prepare something for yourself and your son. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The jar of flour shall not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, until the day when the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She left and did as Elijah had said. She was able to eat for a year, and he and her son as well. The jar of flour did not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, as the Lord had foretold through Elijah. The word of the Lord. The phrase that sticks out the most in this particular reading is, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. That phrase, do not be afraid, is repeated over and over again in the Bible. Over and over again. Mary heard that, do not be afraid. Joseph heard that, do not be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary as your wife. The apostles heard that over and over again. The prophets, Moses... The Bible is full of that particular phrase, do not be afraid. Pope John Paul II, Saint Pope John Paul II, when he began his time as Pope in 1978, October 22nd, 1978, when he was elected as Pope and he came out on, onto the loggia, the balcony at St. Peter's Square, and he greeted the people there at St. Peter's Square and also all over the world through television he pronounced those same very words non abbiate paura which is italian for do not be afraid and people said where did he get this phrase that phrase is all over the Bible. I like to say, you know how many times that phrase is repeated in the Bible? 365 times in the Bible. 365 times. Do you think the Lord God is trying to tell us something? Do not be afraid. No tengan miedo. No nabiate paura. Do not be afraid. So, as much as fear comes into our lives through all that we have to go through on a daily basis. Every single day we should have this phrase repeated to us. Do not be afraid. Why? Because God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? Who can do anything to me? If God is with me, protecting me, guiding me, strengthening me, and accompanying me on this journey throughout life, do not be afraid. As this widow heard this phrase, and widows, you know, had it very hard during the time, during biblical times. They, if you think your life is hard, look at the lives that widows had to live during the time of Jesus. They had a horrible time. Widows were basically left for the dead. They had no rights. 
They couldn't own any property. Many times when a woman was widowed, she was left with two choices in her life. Either to become a prostitute or to beg for her livelihood. So now, when you see the life of a widow and you look at yourself and you get all full of pity by saying, oh, pitiful me all that I have to go through. You think your life is harder than the life of a widow all those centuries ago in biblical times? Our life is nothing compared to the life of a widow during that time. That is why if the Lord God through the mouth of his prophets, because the prophets speak on behalf of God. If the Lord God, through the mouth of prophets, through the mouth of angels, through the mouth of his son, Jesus Christ, can say to a widow, do not be afraid. Don't you think he's trying to tell you the same thing and me the same thing in our own life, through whatever it is that we may be going through? Do not be afraid. It's all going to be fine. You will make it. I am with you. And so the widow in this reading is seen as the widow with the two coins that we will meet in the gospel today. Both widows give away everything that they possessed. Giving away everything that they possessed. The widow in the first reading and the widow that we will meet in the gospel for this coming Sunday prefigure for us the figure of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gave away everything everything as the second reading for this coming weekend proclaims let's look at the second reading from the book of Hebrews Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the true one, but heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf, not that he might offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters each year into the sanctuary with blood that is not his own. If that were so, he would have had to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But now, once for all, he has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. Just as it is appointed that human beings die once, and after this the judgment, so also Christ, offered once to take away the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await Him. The Word of the Lord. So, in the book of Hebrews, over and over again, we have Jesus presented to us as the high priest, the one who offers sacrifice. And the sacrifice that Jesus offers is his life. He gives his life. He gives it all for our sake and invites us to do the same in our life. You see, the widow that we met in the first reading today gave it all. She gave it all. Jesus also gives it all. The widow in the gospel which we will meet, she gives it all as well. All that she possesses. This is the call of discipleship. The call of following Jesus. To give it all. To give our lives. Give our lives as Jesus did. For not his sake, but for the sake of the other. That's how we are to live our life as well. Turning our life into a sacrifice. Blessed, or now Saint John the 23rd, the great saint who opened the Second Vatican Council in 1958, Pope from 1958 till 1963, he said, the Christian life is a sacrifice. And if we look at the life of Jesus as our high priest, 
giving the ultimate sacrifice, we then learn how it is that we are to live our lives as well in the spirit of sacrifice. In other words, every single day I get up and I offer my, my life, offer my sufferings, offer all that comes my way, any insults that may come my way. You know what that's like. A lot of you have to put up with so much in your workplace, in your neighborhood. You have to put up with so much even in church circles. You have to put up so much in your own house. Maybe from your spouse, from your children, from your family members, maybe from friends. You have to put up with so much and you are to offer all of that up for your own sanctification. For our number one call in life is not to be successful, to be famous, to be rich. Our call in life is to be holy, to be holy in imitation of the saints and ultimately in imitation of the one true and holy Jesus Christ who gave it all, who sacrificed it all. This reading that we have just heard continues for us the exposition of the high priestly work of Christ in terms of a series of contrasts with the Levitical priesthood. So in the Old Testament, we have presented to us priests over and over again. Jesus is the new high priest, the new high priest. And he is, ex he is presented to us as such, the one who sacrifices once and for all. His sacrifice, giving his life, puts an end to the need for the high priest to go in and sacrifice over and over again, for his sacrifice is the ultimate one, his life. The reference to the um, second coming of Christ is very important here. This, this is known in theological language as the parousia, which is the belief of Christianity that Jesus will come again at every single mass we say that right after the consecration the priest says let us proclaim the mystery of faith and we say we proclaim your death O Lord and profess your resurrection until you come again so we believe that Jesus will come back and when Jesus comes back again he will restore the human race, he will restore us to the way it was in the very beginning, the way God intended it. How did God intend it? Well, we read that in the very first book of the Bible, before sin entered the world. There was paradise. There was no difference in the beginning between heaven and earth. The first human beings lived in paradise. They lived in heaven. And that's how we will live also when Jesus comes back again. And so this is what we await. But the first Christians believed that Jesus was going to come back right away. Right away, within their lifetime. That's why many of them even stopped working. They stopped living their life. They thought Jesus was going to come back right away. Well, it wasn't so. It wasn't so. And when you're reading the New Testament, this always creeps in there, this idea of the imminent second coming of Christ. And that's why you have to be very careful because there are a lot of people who wish to exploit the New Testament's teaching on the second coming of Christ. And they will say to you, Jesus is going to come right away. He's coming right away. Look at the signs that are happening. Listen, there have been signs happening all throughout the centuries since the death and resurrection of Jesus. As Jesus says himself, no one knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man will come back. So nobody knows. And our measure of time, we live in something called chronos time. It's a Greek term for chronological. That's where we get chronological. That's why we have days, hours, we have clocks, we have calendars. Chronos. This is what human beings live in. That's why 
we measure our time, you know, when somebody gets to be 80, we say, oh, okay, they're old now, right? Or 90, right? For God, it doesn't work that way. That's why we get all confused and we get all worked up when somebody, let's say, who's 10 years old dies, right? We say, it shouldn't be so, right? And we say, how could God allow this? God doesn't live in our time. That's why it's been already more uh, around 2,000 years since the death and resurrection of Jesus because God doesn't live in our times. As the Bible says, a thousand year, years for God is like one day, come and gone. And one day is like a thousand years. Another way, in other words, God's ways are not our ways. We should not pretend to try to understand the ways of God. What we need to do is trust. That's what we need to do. Trust. That's why during this century, the Lord Jesus appeared to a nun, a Polish nun, <laughs> in Poland, St. Faustina Kowalska, and he gave her the great message which has been transmitted throughout the world, the message of his love. And the great message that was proclaimed in that painting, his image, the image of the divine mercy, the Jesus with his rays coming out, you know, the image of Jesus, the divine mercy, Underneath it, he told her to put what? Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Our life of faith is not about belief. Believing anybody can do. Our life is not about belief. Our life of faith is about trust. Believing anybody can do. Even the devil believes, right? The devil is a great believer, right? The devil believes. He believes that God exists. He knows God exists. That's why, you know, when you, if you think to yourself, well, I believe, I'm a believer, so what? You want a cookie because you believe? I mean, great. Our life of faith is about trust. I trust in the Lord. I may not know why things are happening, I may not know why I have to go through this or that, but I trust. I may not know why I'm sick, why I'm depressed, why I have marital problems, why I can't get a job, why this and that. I don't know. It's a mystery. But in the midst of the mystery, I trust. And that's what the Lord Jesus revealed to St. Faustina Kowalska. To tell the world, trust in me and trust in my mercy. Mercy is what? Mercy is God's kindness, God's forgiveness, God's compassion. Ultimately, God's love for all of His people. All of His people. God loves each and every one of His people. We are all so special to God. Each and every one of us made in God's image and likeness. So very special. Christ as high priest sacrifices himself, gives it all for us. Why? Why did, why did Jesus die for you? Ask yourself that question. It's a rhetorical question. Don't answer it. Think of it in yourself. Ask yourself, why did Jesus die for you? Because you deserve Jesus to die for you? No, you're a sinner like me. We're all sinners. The Bible makes it very clear. We're not such wonderful people as everybody, you know, tries to make us think. You know, I'm so good, you know. The Bible makes it clear. We're wicked people, sinful people. That's why we do terrible things. That's why we hurt one another. Who is it that has afflicted so much pain in the world on, on human beings? Demons? Devils? No, other human beings. 
Every time I visit Auschwitz, the concentration camp set up by the Nazis in Poland, it's actually not too far from where I come from in Poland, and it's only about 15 minutes from where Pope John Paul II lived in Poland, and not too far from where St. Faustina gave her message of divine mercy. Every time I go there, where some one and a half million people perished in gas chambers and in ovens, burned to death, burned to death. Unbelievable suffering. Every time I go there, there's one sign that sticks out there that I will remember for the rest of my life. And it says, this is what human beings prepared for other human beings. Next time you think you're so wonderful, or that people are so wonderful, and people are so good, think about that. Human beings throughout the history have prepared what? Slavery? Look at the history of this country. What happened to the Native Americans? To African Americans? Human beings to this very day traffic one another. You think slavery is over? Look at all, human tra all the human trafficking that goes throughout the world. The terrible abuse that goes on of human beings at the hands of other human beings exploiting one another. We do need a Savior, don't we? We do need a Savior. We need a Savior to come and save us. Not from our goodness, but from our wickedness. To come and save us. Our only hope is Jesus Christ. That's the only hope for us and for humanity. For our ultimate salvation. He is our only hope. And so why... Did Jesus come and die for you and give His life for you? There's one only simple answer. Just because. Just because you are you. Because you are precious to Him. You are precious to God. God is pure love. That's the only explanation. Just because. God died for you. Just because. He loves you. You see, every time you look at the cross and you see, that's why the cross is so very important. And we as Catholics, we don't just have crosses with no body on them. We have a body with a corpus on it, a crucifix, like the crosses that we have here, both of them, right? We have on either side of this hall here. We have crosses with bodies on them. That is so very important for us as Catholics to have a cross with a body on it. Why? Because every time you look at Jesus there suffering, it reminds you with His hands outstretched like this. And Jesus proclaims to us every time you look at Him that whenever you doubt how much I love you, look, this is how much I love you with my arms outstretched. I died for you so that I wouldn't have to live without you. That's why God died for us. Send His Son, Jesus, so that He wouldn't have to live without us. Anytime you doubt the love of God, look at the cross. That's why you should have crosses in your house with a body on it. And look at it. Remember, we're Catholic. We love our images, right? We love our statues. We love our crosses, our holy reminders. My room is full of them. All sorts of holy reminders. And they're great. Every morning I get up and I have this cross and I give Jesus a kiss. Of course I'm not kissing. That's not Jesus right there. Okay, but it represents that. It's just like, you know... Somebody from our loved ones who dies, right? You have a picture of them. And you have a picture of them all over your house. Because they're special to you. And sometimes you go up to it and you give them a kiss, right? You're not kissing... The picture is not your loved one. You're, you're kissing a representation of that. We're human beings. Don't let anybody tell you there's anything wrong with images. Or statues. Or crosses. Be proud of your Catholic faith. Seek comfort in it as we look at the beautiful gospel for this coming Sunday from Mark. In the course of his teaching, Jesus said to the crowds, Beware of the scribes 
who like to go around in long robes and accept greetings in the marketplaces, seats of honor in synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour the houses of widows and as a pretext recite lengthy prayers. They will receive a very severe condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and observed how the crowd put money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow also came and put in two small coins worth a few cents. Calling his disciples to himself, he said to them, Amen, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other con contributors to the treasury. For they have all contributed from their surplus wealth, but she from her poverty has contributed all she had, her whole livelihood. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's look at the notes that I have prepared for you for this particular gospel, which is very powerful. This is part of a series of narratives against the religious leadership of his day. We remember that these religious leaders that Jesus is speaking out against, they loved their religious traditions more than God and neighbor. They loved their interpretations of the Old Testament more than God and neighbor. They loved their money more than God and neighbor. They loved their political power more than God and neighbor. They loved their religious power more than God and neighbor. They talked a good line but did not live it. They were the epitomes of hypocrisy. They were blind to God blind to God's love, God's word, God's truth, and ultimately they were blind to God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is admonishing today, through this gospel, any Christian who talks the talk but does not walk the walk. A Christian can use all the right buzzwords, read the Bible, attend church, and do all the churchy things, but lives a lie if he or she does not demonstrate the love of Christ in daily actions. If you are a jerk, <laughs> if you're not kind to other people, if you have a sour face all the time, if you're unable to smile, if you're irritable, that is not demonstrating the love of God. Jesus here isn't just admonishing the religious leadership of the church. Jesus is admonishing each and every one of us. There is very few bishops and priests as compared to all of you, my brothers and sisters. We need you. You are the church. You are to do the work. The church is the lay people. Priests are, of course, very important, which is why, like St. John Vianney, the patron saint of priests, parish priests said, you leave a parish without a priest and people will start worshiping animals. Priests are essential, but you are indispensable. It is your work to go out and proclaim the gospel. Not just for it's the, not the call is not just for priests or bishops. It's for all of us. We are to do the work. We are the church. All of us together. And so this admonishment to live. The gospel is for each and every one of us. 
In this text, there are five self-inflating behaviors of the scribes and Pharisees. Scribes were teachers and recorders of the law of Moses, right? They walked around in long robes in order to gain attention to themselves rather than dressing normally. They liked to be greeted with respect in public places and treated differently. They liked to have the best seats in the small synagogues where everybody could see them. They liked to have places of honor at banquets, the head table to the right of the host. They said long prayers for the sake of appearance. In fact, they did everything for the sake of appearance. They weren't praying devoutly to God, but were praying for show, to show how devout they were. This is a reflection for all of us. This is one of the reasons why Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room and pray to your Father who sees in secret and who will reward you in secret. That doesn't mean we should not be going to Mass or going to church or playing, praying in public. It's a reflection of what is my attitude when I pray. Am I doing it for show? Like I have to be the loudest when I pray the rosary in church so that others can hear? What is the motivation behind my actions. So, here in this text we see that many rich people put in large sums of money, right? Certain rich people were putting in large sums of money for the sake of appearance. <coughs> Again, this is another reflection of why it is that I donate, right? Do I wish for others to see how generous I am. Just as certain people who wore long robes and said long prayers for the sake of appearance. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. The words widow and poor were intrinsically linked in Jesus' time. When you said widow, you automatically knew that the person was poor. Why were widows poor? Because the Old Testament laws of inheritance prevented widows from receiving anything from her husband's estate. The inheritance went to the oldest son. In the Old Testament, widows and orphans were often associated as people who experienced injustice. Both widows and orphans were the most vulnerable of people, and society often ignored their needs. In the Greek language, these small copper coins were known as lepton. This was the smallest of Jewish coins, just as a penny is the smallest of all coins in our American society. In other words, it doesn't matter that in the eyes of the world, what we have to give may be very insignificant, like a penny. If we give it out of love and devotion and a spirit of generosity, this pleases God. You see, what God is after is our hearts. God wants our hearts. That's why Jesus proclaims, you know, the heart of these people is so, so far from me. God wants our heart. As long as your heart is with God, that's what matters, that your heart is close to God. Then Jesus calls his disciples and says to them, you notice that Jesus called them over, so that means they were there in the temple, right, with, with him, and he calls them over, and he wants to show this widow as an example to them. Now, we are the disciples of Jesus. When I say the word disciple, that means student. The word disciple comes from the Latin discipuli, which means student. So all of us are students of Jesus Christ. He is our rabbi, right? Yes. Our teacher. Rabbi means teacher, our master. We are all Jesus' students. He comes to teach us. And so he's calling us over 
in like manner as he called his first followers, his first disciples, and he says, come here, let me introduce you to this widow. And he points her out and says to them what? Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. This poor widow. The value of her gift was not determined by its numerical size, but what it represented. All that she had. Her life. Her life. Because, as the Bible here says to us, she had nothing else to give. In giving up all that she had, she's giving her life. She's giving it all to Jesus, to God. Because where, where was this treasure? It was in the temple, in God's house. She's coming there. Can you imagine? She has nothing in her life. Her life is so full of suffering, the life of a widow. A life full of suffering and problems. And she comes and she gives it all. Here, Lord, take my life. Do with me as you wish. This has to be our attitude. Here, Lord, here's my life. I come to do your will. We are to give it all to God. All of our life. Everything. The Bible here says nothing was left. Nothing should be left in us. We have to give it all. Now, so many of us we feel like we're so insignificant, like nobody notices us. We feel unloved. This is the greatest poverty in the world today. According to Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who worked with the poorest of the poor, the greatest poverty in the world is not material poverty. It's not that you don't have enough things or enough food. The greatest poverty in the world today is the poverty of love. People not feeling wanted, cherished, like somebody desires them, somebody cares for them. That is why we have so much suicide. According to the National Institutes of Health, Suicide rates have never been higher than they are today. People committing suicide left and right, taking their own life. The most prescribed drugs around are not for cholesterol or diabetes. The most prescribed drugs today are for depression and anxiety. So many people in our midst depressed, down, and miserable. That's why we need a Savior. See, Jesus didn't just come to save us from eternal punishment or eternal doom. He didn't just come to save us from hell. Jesus came to save us from our own personal hell. You know what the definition of hell is? The definition of hell is the absence of God. How many people today, how many of us, so many times in our life, feel the absence of God? No God. That's hell. How many people live a, a hell right here on earth? The misery of this life. That's what God comes to save us from. The word salvation comes from the Latin salus which is health. It means health. God doesn't just come to restore you to eternal life. He comes to restore your soul to health. To bring you health. The health of your soul. To fill your spirit with life. That's the health Jesus wants for all of us. That only comes when we 
start feeling like there is someone in our life that loves us and cares for us and is with us that somebody sees us as was the case in the widow in today's gospel God saw her as God sees each and every one of us as far as the widow was concerned in the gospel today no one saw her right no one saw her but then again no one ever saw her she was just one of those invisible people that no one ever sees how many invisible people in our midst maybe you feel like that that no one sees you well i'm here today to proclaim to you that i see you i see you but more importantly god sees you in the african culture in africa the way that people greet one another they don't greet one another by like americans do by saying hi how are you <laughs> right and nobody really cares right that's just a form of saying right how are you fine thank you you know i might have just lost a, a loved one but i'm fine thank you right okay i might have cancer in my body but i'm fine thank you you know <laughs> everybody says how are you in Africa they don't do that in Africa people when they greet one another particularly in villages where the Western culture hasn't crept in yet okay where the American Embassy is not present yet do you know what the American Embassy is whenever you go through when I whenever I travel to other countries whenever I see the big M I see, oh, there's the American Embassy. Do you know what the M is? McDonald's! <laughs> <laughs> and you know how true that is. In my country of Poland, obesity is on the rise. Oh yeah, mm, obesity is tragically on, on the rise like it has never been before with the onslaught of KFC mm. yeah I was when last time I was in Poland they were gonna have a party for my grandma's birthday and they said oh we're, we're having it catered and I said catered why and they said oh we have a great American restaurant that just opened in the city nearby and I said oh what is it KFC <laughs> numbers <laughs> so we had KFC <laughs> but in in particularly in African villages where the Western culture hasn't crept in yet when people greet one another do you know what they say they say to one another when they greet someone they say I see you and you know what the person responds I am here I see you I am here we could all learn that to see each other you know that we're not just numbers we're not numbers you know where that's why the Nazis in the concentration camps they tattooed numbers on people they were just numbers and you know where that comes from numbers who else is represented as a number? The devil, right? Six, six, six. Just a number. To the devil, we are all just numbers. Right? We're all numbers. Like our I, I, the IRS has for us. Just has numbers. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> numbers. To God, we are individuals and we are special each and every one of us God sees us and invites us to see one another to see each other I see you I'm here that's why whenever any of you come and talk to me I always make sure that I try to focus on you right there 
as imperfectly as I do that, but I try to focus on you at that very moment. Right? And that's why I don't like it when I'm speaking with somebody, somebody's pulling on me because they, you know, especially after Mass, because they can't wait another five minutes. You know, everybody's always in a hurry. You know, or some people are just waiting right there, right when I come out of, of Mass to try to get me because they can't wait another 10 minutes, you know, to say hello. Or when people come to confession and there's a long line and they say to me, Father, I have to hurry because there is a long line. I, you know what I always say? Don't worry about it. At this time, you are the most important person here. This is your time with God. Don't worry about it. Take your time. If they don't want to wait, they can go. If they're in such a hurry, if they're so busy, and that's how we are. We're always so busy. That's another Western culture thing, right? So busy. If you're so busy, that means you're too busy. If you're too busy, it means you're too busy. <laughs> how many people at Mass, they can't even wait for the final blessing? Got my communion out the door, right? No time. No time. No time. Life will pass us by every minute we, we lose is a minute we will never get back. Spend your time on that which matters in this life. God. And so... The scribes during Jesus' day were the elite of society, doctors of the law, whose long years of study made them the official interpreters of God's word. They were forbidden to receive pay for their jobs, so they lived on subsidies instead, a little from their students, a little from the poor box, a little from the temple treasury. In other words, they took their, as we say in Spanish, mordidas, okay? <laughs> You know, they took their little, uh, a little from here, a little from there. They helped themselves, in other words, okay? They were invited to people's homes and had the best seats. The scribes were the ones to watch. People watched them, paid attention to them. They were important. Now, who did Jesus watch in the temple? Who did he pay attention to? Did he watch them? No. Jesus didn't pay attention to them. Jesus paid attention to the insignificant, the widow, the one who was insignificant. The widow did not catch anyone else's attention, but she caught Jesus' attention. See, she went up there, nobody would have paid attention because here's a poor widow. What can she give there, right? Yeah, if it was somebody really rich, oh, they would have paid attention, right? She is all used up. The scribes wouldn't dare pay any attention to her because they knew she had no meat in her house to prepare for them. Because they would go to people's homes and eat the best food. They had no use for a poor widow. She didn't even have any meat left on her bones, let alone in her house, to cook for them. She was out of food, out of money. She had nothing in terms of things to give. Therefore, she seemed useless. If you feel like that in your life, so many of us, sometimes we feel like that, you know, we feel useless, worthless. This is where the gospel comes into our life. The salus, the, the health. That's the good news. The word gospel means good news. That's the good news. As useless as you may feel, as worthless as you may think you are, Jesus comes and says, Hello! You are mine. I love you. The essence of the gospel. You know what the essence of the gospel is? It's very simple. God loves you. That's the essence of the gospel. What more do we need to hear? When widows lost their husband, they not only lost their place and their name, but they lost their face as well. They became nothing. 
She has become invisible. No one sees her anymore. No one except Jesus. He saw her walk to the temple treasury to give up her two coins. And something about the way she did it, something about the way she did it, let him know that it was the end for her. That it was everything she had. So that when she surrenders her two coins and turns to go, he knew she had nothing left that was not God's. Her sacrifice was complete. So complete that that is why he calls his followers over to witness it. We know her today because she held nothing back. And this made her last penny a fortune in God's eyes. Some people today say we need to give 10%, right? They say, especially the fundamentalists, and if you go to any of those uh, evangelical churches or any of the other fundamentalist places, they'll be telling you, if you don't give 10%, mm -mm -mm, that's why you're not blessed in your life. But if you give 10%, you know, things, yeah. Yeah. I had I met a lady once who was going to, uh, she was Hispanic, and uh, she was invited to go to some fundamentalist church where the preacher was preaching. He says, I have just had a revelation. That which is keeping you away from God is your jewelry. Here, in this cup, you are to come forward if you wish to be free and deposit all your jewelry. <laughs> and she says, Father, I couldn't believe it. People were going forward, taking their earrings off, their rings off, and depositing it in there. And I said, and what did you do? And she says, I no soy tarruga. You know? <laughs> I'm not that dumb. <laughs> Turn around and left. Be careful. Be careful. In other words, be careful. There's a lot of people who wish to exploit vulnerable people. And we are all vulnerable because so many of us feel insignificant. We feel unloved. We are hungry for God. Be careful. Don't allow somebody to exploit you. If you follow the example of the people who say you got to give a percentage, then you can see what is the percentage that the widow gave. What is her percentage? A hundred percent! She gave it all. And so many fundamentalists use this particular gospel and they say that's why you need to give, right? You need to give. They say the, the widow's might or whatever they, they call it. She gave 100%. She didn't give 10%. We are called to give sacrificially, not 10%. The Catholic Church doesn't teach that, that you're supposed to give 10%. You're supposed to give till it hurts, right? Of everything in your life, not just your money. It's not about 10%. We generally admire this story for the widow's generosity. But I wonder about that. You know, I really wonder about that. What if this was a poor person today who sends in their last penny to the 700 Club? Or some of the other preachers, right? On TV, who say, send your money, right? Send your money, folks. And people send it. They send their money. Is it right for the poor to surrender their last to those who live more luxuriously than they do? There's that preacher on TV, Creflo Dollar, who just got this big new jet, right? He got a big new jet. And people send money. They're 10%. Is that right? Of course it isn't. Beware of those who wish to exploit the gospel, especially the poor. Look at the example of Pope Francis, a fiat, right? Carrying his own bag. For I have come to serve and not to be served. 
The wealth gospel is so popular today. So many people into the wealth gospel. The gospel is not about wealth. The gospel is about health. Spiritual health. Which is offered to the rich and to the poor. To everyone. Was it right for the poor widow to surrender her two coins to a morally corrupt and bankrupt institution? Is this admirable or scandalous? I say it's scandalous when people are made to surrender their last. Beware and be careful. God doesn't desire 10%. God desires sacrifice. Our life. We give sacrificially, not in percentage. Do not allow yourself to be taken advantage of by those who wish to exploit religion for their own personal gain and profit. Do you know the best way to make money in this country? Fastest way to make money? Open a church! <laughs> Open a church. Just know how to speak well, you know. Brainwash people and you'll get rich really fast, as we have seen over and over again. Beware of wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. The sacraments are free. Grace is free. There's no price on it. Jesus nowhere here praises this widow for what she is doing, right? He's not praising her for what she has done. He simply calls the disciples over to notice her, to see what she does, and to compare what everyone else is doing. He's inviting his disciples to sit down beside him and contemplate the disparity that is the difference between apparent sacrifice and the real thing. Because every, everybody else there, the scribes and all the rich who were going there, they were sacrificing too. They were, but he's, look at the real thing, her life. Not her money, her life. That's what God desires. That's the real thing. Jesus does not dismiss the gifts of the rich. He simply points out that the major characters are minor givers. And while the minor character, the poor widow, turns out to be the major donor. In other words, this is the last of Jesus' teachings about the upside-down kingdom of God. Jesus comes to turn everything upside down. It's all upside down, like here, in this particular story. Where the last shall be first, and the great shall be the servants of all. And the most unlikely people will turn out to have been Christ himself in disguise. When he leaves the temple area, his public ministry is over. In four days, Jesus will also give it all up. His life. The two copper coins. You see, the widow foreshadows Jesus. Just like the widow was giving it all up, her life, so too Jesus will in like manner give it all. The widow gave her all her life to a corrupt institution. Jesus gave his life for a corrupt world. You could say that the widow gave it all up to a corrupt church, because that was her church, right? That was her, her religion. She gave it all, didn't she? Jesus gives it all for a corrupt church as well. And when I say corrupt church, I'm not talking about bishops and priests. We are the church. 
All of us are corrupted, as I've been telling you today. Wicked, sinful. Next time you look at a bishop or a priest and you try to pass judgment and say, N -n -n -n, look, at your, <laughs> look at yourself in the mirror. Look at yourself in the mirror first before you do that. We are the church. Jesus gave his life for us as corrupted as we may be, as sinful as we may be. With our sinfulness, Jesus nevertheless dies for us. She withheld nothing from God, neither did Jesus. This is why he calls his disciples over and says, This is what I have been talking about from the whole time that I have been with you preaching. This is what I have been talking about. Look at her. Look at her. This is what I have been talking about. She walked into the temple with her last two coins in her hand and she walked out again without them, totally unaware that she was being watched. Just like us in our world, so many times we are unaware of God's presence in our life. And yet, I am here to proclaim to you today that just like this widow, you and I are being watched. God watches us. God sees us. She came in with no name and she left with no name, right? Our dignity does not come from the world or from what is going on around us. Our dignity does not come from what the world gives us. Our dignity comes from who watches us, who watches over us. Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our brother, our friend, our companion, who's watching over us, who sees us, and who says to us, I see you, I am here, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus. The applause is, of course, for the Lord. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We know that you see us, that you are with us. We know that you are here in our midst as we have gathered here in your name. We bless your name today and always. And we ask in turn for your blessing in our lives, that we may come to know how much you love us, you cherish us, and you desire us. As we glorify your name now and always, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you for coming. Come next week.